If you read, there's roughly 30,000 marketing strategy books on Amazon. And if you read all of them, we haven't read all of them, but between me, Cole, and, and Eddie, my partners, you know, we've read most of the important ones. The premise in virtually all of them is there is a market and we are going to attack, compete, or disrupt this existing market with our better product. And we're going to build a brand and the strength of our product and our brand will win the day. And that, my friends, is why over 90% of companies fail. That would be a great strategy, but it doesn't work. Hey, hey, welcome to another episode of Marketing Against the Grain, your show that tells you the stories of how people and businesses grow in counterintuitive ways. I'm your co-host, Kip Bodner. I am joined, as always, by my co-host, Kieran Flanagan, and we have a special guest today. We are joined by the one and only Christopher Lockett. He is one of the predominant experts of category design. We're going to talk all about category design and why he's got a little blood on his nose, his sick guitar is in the <laughs> background. We got, a lot, we got a lot we're going to cover today. Christopher, thanks for joining the show today. Thanks for being here. Yep, Karen, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. All right, Karen, we got a long list of stuff we want to try to get in today's episode. Like, let's get right to it, man. So we're big fans. Read the book, Play Bigger. I have the book, Snow Leopard. I am a subscriber to Category Pirates. I think you guys produce some of the best content online. Let's set the scene for our listeners, because I think people kind of understand category creation, but not really. And so maybe let's set the scene just, could you maybe just talk to us about how you describe category creation and why you thought it was important enough to kind of write the book, play bigger? So it turns out that in marketing and entrepreneurship and frankly, business more broadly, there is a unquestioned, undiscussed, undialogued set of assumptions that people make that go like this. If we're going to start a business, we're going to do a marketing campaign, we're going to launch a product, we're going to launch a company, et cetera, et cetera. What we're doing here, the unspoken that never gets acknowledged or discussed is what we're doing is competing. And we're competing in an existing market for demand. And our strategy for winning this competition game is we are going to have a better product and a better brand. And once we communicate to the world that we have a better product and a better brand, we will win. When most people say entrepreneurship, when most people say marketing, that's all of the context that sits around what most people say. And if you read, there's roughly 30,000 marketing strategy books on Amazon. And if you read all of them, we haven't read all of them, but between me, Cole, and, and Eddie, my partners, you know, we've read most of the important ones. The premise in virtually all of them is exactly what I just described. There is a market and we are going to attack, compete, or disrupt this existing market with our better product and we're going to build a brand and the strength of our product and our brand will win the day. And that my friends is why over 90% of companies fail. That would be a great strategy, but it doesn't work. And if you study what the legends do, what you discover is nobody legendary, nobody that you respect and admire as an entrepreneur as a marketer, as a creator, as an artist, as a social change agent, ever did any of that. What all of them did was they broke and took new ground. They were different, not better. And that's why they stood out. And it was connecting their different to making a difference for others that made them and or their company product and brand the extraordinary thing that we love, respect, and admire. And so the aha with category design is category design is a business strategy that empowers leaders to create a different future, to become known for a category they own. Now, why is this important? Seven years ago, we embarked on a category science research project to understand how market categories work. See, we thought somebody else might have done this research. It turned out nobody had, so we had to do it on our own. And the research was fundamentally different. Most people in marketing and business measure market share and market size. And the harbinger for competition they use is, are we 
gaining or losing market share as we compete. And so there was good data around market share. What there was no data for is in any given market category, what percentage of the total value of that market as measured by not revenue in the category, but market cap, that is to say total value created. We did that research and we published it in the Harvard Business Review. And it turns out that in tech categories, one company earns 76% of the total market cap slash market capitalization in any given market category. So here's the aha. And it's a real mind fuck for most people. The company that designs the space is best positioned to dominate the space. And if you're not the category designer, you've made an unconscious, unquestioned, undialogued, undiscussed, unconsidered decision to compete for 24% of the value. And we think that's stupid. Okay, so I, I got to follow up here because there's one thing that Kieran and I debate and, uh, and argue about a lot. Would love to get your take is we believe that many modern businesses are built off of distribution leverage, distribution advantages. And you're seeing that come out now with folks like Mr. Beast and other folks who have large audiences then going into existing categories and taking market share and monetizing them. Do you think the rise of influencers and individual brands is going to make category design less important or more important? Like, where do you think that fits into all of this? Well, let me answer your question and I'll explain quickly why. Please, more please. important is the answer. And here's the thing that people understand. If what the game was about was creating as big a digital audience as possible and then trying to monetize that audience in every which way from Sunday. Because if you listen to Gary VD or any of these other social media hustle porn star types, that's what they'll tell you. Go build audience, 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 publish, 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 10,000 things a day, puke it out on the internet, build your audience, and then figure out how to monetize your audience. Well, if that was true, Pornhub would be the most valuable company on planet Earth. You think? Porn as a category is the largest percentage of content consumption on the internet. By, I don't have the data in front of me. We can sure. look it up if you like, but by a lot. And so if you want audience, you know, get naked, get your friend Steve to video what's going on <laughs> and go for it. But at, the, but at the same time, like you could argue that just sites like Pornhub are just severely under monetized. Part of it's not just having a big audience. It's like how you monetize that audience. Right. And I think that there are some people who've been very successful on how they monetize their audience. And you can have a bunch of people out there with big audience that sell influence for other brands. And that's pretty stupid because it's the it's the people who build kind of the vertical integration of differentiated product on top of that influence and monetize it well that I think can be really successful. And, and quite frankly, I think make category design maybe less important because of that. Well, can we have a little fun here, Kip? Let's do it. Uh, th we're, the whole point is to have a big argument. It's gonna be fun. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this with love. I'm going to use your own words against you. Do you Please. know what you just said at the beginning of that paragraph? Remind me. You used the word highly differentiated. Or yeah. you certainly used the word differentiated. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Category design is the ultimate differentiation strategy. And the reason Mr. Beast exists is because he's a category of one. He is a new model of digital, native digital entertainer. And the reason his burger joint has worked is because A, he's leveraged his unique category position as a digital entertainer with a unique business model, which is he's not just building his own restaurants, he's not just franchising restaurants, He's doing cloud kitchens. Yeah. So if kitchens, the three yeah. of us own a restaurant together and maybe we make pizza and now we decide, you know what? Burgers might be cool. We can become a cloud kitchen. We don't have to buy a franchise. It's this whole new model for adding a new category of product to an existing restaurant, leveraging a new distribution channel. And so my point is, if you study Mr. Beast, what you will learn is that every time he makes a move, He's pioneering a radically different type of business, different type of entertainment content. And fundamentally, being different, not better, is the foundation 
of category design. So I think this is a really good point, actually, because the Mr. Beast example, you're touching on the fact that he, he grew his audience in a differentiated way, or his category helped him grow audience, and then audience helps him launch companies. I think the thing Kip and I debate sometimes, or I think somewhat in agreement with sometimes as well, is like product is being commoditized and actually distribution is the biggest point of leverage. But I think you're you're saying that, yeah, but the way you build distribution is still trying to find a way to grow an audience in a very differentiated way. Like Mr. Beast is a good example of someone who built audience on YouTube, an existing platform, but it, the way he did that was spend way more money on creating these entertaining videos than anyone had ever thought or aspired to do before. Yeah, so he created a new category of digital entertainer. See, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, Mr. Beast would have been trying to get a TV show. Right, yes. And he would have hired an agent and gone to Hollywood and, and tried to get on some major cable network more than likely, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He said, and I'm paraphrasing, fuck that. There's this new model on the internet called direct to consumer, right? And direct to creator. So he bypassed all the intermediaries. In the beginning of the internet, one of the most popular words in the late 90s was disintermediation. And what disintermediation is all about is exactly what we are doing right now. See, 20 years ago, if we wanted to do this, we'd have to go on CNN or Fox <laughs> Business, or we'd have to go on some radio fucking show, and we'd have to beg for time, and we'd have to convince some person, and there would have been a whole bunch of PR, and there would have been all this, all these gatekeepers and toll takers in the way of us doing exactly what we're doing. None of those exist today. The insight that Mr. Beast had was, what if I apply some of the same learnings from the from classic kind of industry, right? How do I create a legendary show? Invest the money in the production and disintermediate everybody in the process and do something different. And that's why he's the most powerful digital entertainer in the world. Right. Can we just touch on something really quick? One of the things that I'm seeing in my network of people who work within tech, the thing that people really value right now is notoriety. <laughs> like literally everyone wants to be famous in some respects within whatever niche they are in. Like they want to build audience. I, I kind of made a joke on, on Twitter. Like the real goal of an entrepreneur is to build business, sell business for a lot of money so they can actually spend the time doing the thing they think is really important, which is create Twitter threads, right? Like personal brand, it feels like has never been more important to person or to people. And Christopher, one of the things you said off mic is creating a personal brand is kind of bullshit. I would love for you to maybe touch on that. Like, why do you think that that is not an important thing for people to focus on? Okay, good. So I'm just grabbing the quote it's from one of my heroes, Tom Waits. There is nothing more embarrassing than a person who tries to guess what the great American public would like, make a compromise for the first time and falls flat on his face. I would rather be a failure on my own terms than a success on someone else's. That's a difficult statement to live up to. But then I've always believed that the way you affect your audience is more important than how many of them there are. So the reason I share that with you is the digital marketing world, the digital creator and content world, by and large has its head up its ass. <laughs> Tell, and, tell us and, how you really feel, please. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to this new class to learn how to kind of come out of my shell. Totally. It's a digital course I'm taking. Yeah. <laughs> and frankly, it's been perpetuated by the hustle porn stars who've told us it's all about content. It's not about quality of content. And it's all about posting 200 times a day. And it's all about, quote unquote, building audience. None of that's true. Not a fucking word of it's true. And here's my proof. You guys have Twitter and LinkedIn and whatever followers, yeah? Sure, yeah. So take a printout or even have it on your phone for that matter. Go to the grocery store, go to like Trader Joe's or something like that and get a couple hundred bucks worth of groceries and go up to the cashier <laughs> and give her your phone and show her how many followers you have on LinkedIn. I do that all the time. And see, <laughs> right, does she give you groceries? No. <laughs> exactly. And if you look, you know, more young people today want to be an influencer than anything else. Yes. If you look at the CPM rates that influencers get today, 
you know, you'd say, hey, if you had 250,000 followers on TikTok, that would be a lot. If you had 2 million followers on TikTok, you probably would think you're a rock star. Well, go look at what the CPM rates are. You're better off working at Starbucks than trying to monetize through advertising a fucking Twitter following or a LinkedIn following or a flick flock or dick doc or whatever fuck following. And so you can chase vanity metrics. And if it makes you feel good to go, oh, look, <laughs> two million people follow me. That must make up for the fact that my mother didn't love me. If that if that's who you oh, are. Look, all then... these people didn't get hugged enough as children. We can we exactly. can just establish that right now. And if we what we need to do is validate that we're worth it a thousand times a day on the Internet, then go ahead and have at that. Don't be confused. You're not building a business. And here's the truth. Most content is content free content. Let me say that again. Most content is 100% content free. And what I mean by that is the following. Most of what we see on the internet today is shit we've seen a million times. And we don't need to see again. Hey guys, it's Wednesday. <laughs> you can do it. I'm having a burrito. Let's go. For <laughs> okay, that's content. There's a hustle porn star out there right now tried to get on, tried to get on my podcast and I you know Sometimes I think I should have had him on. Say names. I let the people. Name names. Uh, yeah. Ed Milet. Okay. Okay. So Ed Milet is one of these super jacked hustle porn stars. <laughs> He's one of those sorts of guys, right? Sam yep. Kinison come back as a jacked, you know, 50 year old guy that looks like you sure as fuck want to invite him over to your house because he might tear through the walls. <laughs> anyway, he came out with a new book not long ago and I, I, I'll get it a little bit wrong, but the book's called something like one more. And you ready for the insight? You ready? This Please. is the breakthrough insight. I've got my pen. For how to have a legendary business <laughs> and a legendary life. You wrote a big old book about this. Spent a bazillion dollars marketing it, did the tour and all that stuff. You ready for it? Here it is. Do one more. <laughs> That's what it is. You're at the gym. Do one more push up. Do one more pull up. Yeah. Do one more minute. Push yourself. I'm telling you're in marketing. <laughs> Before you leave the office, you're about to leave. Send one more email. One more. More. One more. Right? And that's the whole fucking thing. That's the whole thing. That's the genius Einstein level breakthrough insight into personal development and growth and unlimited business and financial success. Do one more. And so what's happened here? We've monetized marketing and entrepreneurship stupidity at scale. I've been in Silicon Valley for the better part of 30 years. I've been lucky enough to work with some of the most legendary venture capitalists and entrepreneurs in the history of Silicon Valley. Not one of them thinks the secret to success is one more <laughs> or the asinine bullshit that comes out of publications like Stink Magazine and Fast Company Magazine. All the secret to success is knowing exactly what Elon Musk has before breakfast. <laughs> right? And so there's all this stupid clickbaity, meme-based garbage. And here's the thing. If you want to consume some of that, that's fine. It's okay to have an Oreo every once in a while. Oreos are yummy. I like to watch some stupid shit on TV every once in a while. Hell yeah, who do. doesn't? Right. But if you consume Oreos and that's all you eat, you're going to turn into a fat, lazy, sick fuck. <laughs> and that's what's happened in the content-free content world that we now live in. <laughs> You can't handle it. You can't handle it. <laughs> the audio is thing. Just is let you. it out. Just let it out. Oh, I love it. I love it. Uh, okay, so so I guess to like uh, debate this point a little, there's some valid like like CEOs, right? Like if you actually, Kevin and I did this episode where we really dug into like the history of cults, right? Because we really wanted to break down how you build a cult brand. I think build, part of building a cult brand is actually some of the things that you really talk about through all of the the content you you create on category creation. But there's a study done in the 1800s of cults, and there was this really cool thing that they found that most cults had a charismatic leader. We understand that, and they had this thing called routinization of charisma. And I won't, I won't get into that. You can listen to that in a previous episode. But like every great cult has charismatic leader, and you could say that most great companies have great founder. And even in your own book, you talk about the fact that actually category creation comes from unique insight from founders, and some founders want notoriety because they actually want to be the vehicle through which the category is created or vocalized. Do you see that as a valid part of even category creation, which is like the founder themselves want a notoriety to have strong point of view and create category? Like that's a good reason to actually want to have personal brand because it's intertwined within the 
the kind of job of creating the category and getting people to believe that transformational story? No. Okay. Not in the way you said it. Okay. As a matter of fact, everything that you just said in the context you said it <laughs> leads to really bad outcomes, bad okay. outcomes for the company and bad outcomes personally. See, this idea of personal branding is one of the biggest uh, myths ever perpetrated on entrepreneurs. Because the minute you say, I want a personal brand, you've now made yourself a product. Hmm. And you're a person, not a product. And I know people who became huge personal brands, so to speak. And when their product wasn't that popular anymore, their psyche was fucked. So if you're going to build your value and your self-esteem on your ability to create digital audience, that's what your marker is. You're going to damage yourself. You're going to damage your company in a meaningful way. And I'll tell you, anybody who wants to be famous is fucking stupid <laughs> because I've had people walk down my uh, driveway and want to have a conversation with me about shit they've heard on my podcast. That's not fucking fun. And I'm nowhere near famous. And I know some very seriously famous people. And none of it's fun. Because you know what? We can go out tonight and go to the best restaurant in your town or my town and have a great time. And no one's going to bug us. And we might bump into some friends or what have you. And that would be nice. But for the most part, we're going to have a great old time. If you're famous, you can't go to the grocery store. And why you want that is beyond comprehension to me. Now, here's the truth. What most people want is a reputation. And that's not something you can manufacture. Brands are made up. What a brand is, is I try to present myself in the way that I think you want me to be so that you'll like me and buy my shit. And so I create a cartoon character of myself. And I play a character called me. You guys have guessed it on podcasts, right? All the time. Have you yeah. ever been on this kind of a podcast? I did it twice. Before the podcast, you're having a normal conversation, just like we're having right now. And then the podcast starts. And just like Kip did the intro off the top here, the person goes from like this to, Hi, hey, everybody. <laughs> welcome to the Asshole of the Week show. The entrepreneurs are not alone. And today we're going to land and we're going to value bombs. We're going to live a lot. And you're like, well, what, what just happened to you, man? Did somebody put an electrical charge on your nuts? <laughs> like, who, who are you? You just turned into some kind of a weird, or, or, or people maybe are not that over the top of it. Then they try to be very professorial, you know, because they went to Harvard or, or whatever. They play a character on the internet. Elves. Right. And what you actually want, we connect on our similarities. If you and I like the same sports or we like the same music, or maybe we grew up in the same town, or maybe we're from the same country or whatever the case may be with the same religion or whatever it is, human beings, in the, particularly in the beginning, when they're trying to uh, get to know each other, we connect on our similarities. But the reality is we want to be valued and we want to be loved for who we are, what makes us different, not the same. And from a business perspective, it turns out that every company, every product and every brand, with very few exceptions, is successful because they become known for a category they own. And so the irony is human beings are taught that the pathway to success is to fit in, when in point of fact, the most successful people, companies, brands, and products are the ones that stand out. And this dichotomy sits at the center of what category design is, which is how can I create a place for myself and or my company where I take what makes us radically different and connect it to something that's radically valuable for people in a way that they get it through this thing we call a point of view. And once the world gets the value of your different, both as an individual and or as a company, all of a sudden they have an aha. Particularly when you connect your different to a problem that they have. This is the fundamental problem with marketing. Marketing is all about us. Let's build a brand. Well, what's building a brand? Built a brand, if you go back, one of the things in category design, there's some core tenets. And one of them is listen to the words. Listen to the words. Branding. You guys know where the term comes from? Give everybody the update. Where, where's it from? Well, you own livestock. Oh, and you yeah, have a, yeah. a logo yeah. Yeah. that tells people that's your livestock, not their livestock. And you take that thing in and iron 
and you heat it up hot and you burn it into typically the backside of an animal in a horribly painful, what many say are inhumane way. That's what a brand is. That's where the term comes from. So let's just think about this for a second. Several decades ago, a bunch of marketing idiots got together and said, you know, we're having a hard time convincing the world that what we do really matters. And we're, we're stuck, sick and tired of being stuck at the children's table in the executive room. And we want to eat with the big kids. And so we got to figure out a different way to communicate the value of what we do. So I know, let's take the word that means maiming an animal <laughs> to prove ownership, to describe <laughs> our profession. No, that's what we did. I, you can't make this up. Google it. No, no. It's, it's so exactly what do what marketers do? This is where the biggest fundamental premise in marketing comes from that is a thousand percent wrong, which is, oh, I want to brand as much as possible so that I can be known. Because if people know my name, good things will happen. And so I want to brand me in their head, in their body, on their ass. So a few weeks ago, gentlemen, I had a conversation with a S&P S 50, excuse me, CMO. They have a $200 million a year branding budget. When he took I'm over- the, it's not higher. That's a big, that's a big budget. Uh, yeah, one of the biggest, big budget. One of the big, biggest brand advertisers in the country. He did an audit of all of that. And you know what he learned? Almost all of it, is worthless. By what measure? Here's my proof. Okay, so let's look at some of the dumbest brand marketing you can do. You ever, uh, where do you guys live? You're on the East Coast in Boston, right? I'm in Boston. Kieran's in, in Dublin. <laughs> in Ireland. Oh, beautiful. Mm. Why is it that the Guinness tastes better there? What, what is that? We sell you Americans all of the crap stuff we don't want. <laughs> Would you stop doing that? Because I cannot so find, good. you know, I've been to your beautiful country more than once and I've had more than a pint or two and a Jameson or two sitting in some it's, of your uh, it's a lot less, better. less it's the best place, less uh, prestigious establishments, let's say. And I can't replicate the taste here. So I, I don't even try. I drink West Coast IPAs because I can't get what you guys do. Okay. So here we have a, an indoor stadium a rink where the San Jose Sharks play and a bunch of other shit happens there. And the branding idiots at uh, SAP, by the way, SAP, think about this for a second. SAP. SAP. Listen to the words. Um, hey, guys, I don't know if anybody ever fucking told you. You named the company SAP. <laughs> <laughs> the company's called SAP. And that might be cool in Germany. I don't know what the fuck SAP means in German. But over here, if you're a SAP, you're a SAP. It's not good. <laughs> Anyways, so the folks at SAP decided that they would sponsor what heretofore was called the Shark Tank. And it's called the SAP Arena or the SAP, whatever the fuck it's called. Now, thousands of people go to see Taylor Swift there. Thousands of people go to see the San Jose Sharks there and all these other things that they go do there. And they know that they're going to the SAP Stadium. Now, how do you think as a percentage of people, what percentage of people even know when they go to the SAP Center that it's SAP, not SAP? Oh, it's got to be low. I would say right. nearly zero. Sub 10%. Right. So so 90% of the people who go there think they're going to the SAP yeah. stadium. That's point A. Point B, if you said to them, hey, what does SAP do? No idea. I don't, I don't know why a bunch of maple syrup growers from the East Coast are sponsoring this fucking stadium. <laughs> I have no idea, but whatever. We like the sharks. And so my point is one of the fundamental premises of marketing is, or premi, is premi the, what's the plural of premise? Premises. I think it's, it's like, premises. what's the plural of Prius? Is it pre I? <laughs> I don't know. All I know is if you drive a pre I, please, for the love of God, get out of the left hand lane. Just get out of the left hand lane. <laughs> drive a faster just, car. Or, no, just get over. I don't give a shit. Drive. God bless you. God bless you. I'm in a Mustang GT Shelby Cobra. I need you to get out of the way. <laughs> and so the point, though, here is the entire marketing industry fell for this idea of reach and frequency, which is. The more people that know my name, the better it is for me. And the reality is, I don't know how much SAP spends on the SAP arena every year, but I can guarantee you because I just talked to a CMO who just did an audit with a company that is larger than that company with a spend that would be an equal size spend, I would imagine, if not greater. And um, it's very clear that they know 
if it's slapping your name on a stadium or slapping your name generically in an airport or any of those things, you know, maybe it helps a slight bit on the margin, but in generally, branding's a dumb idea. And the fundamental reason for it is this. Brands are about us, our products, our services, the value we provide and deliver. Categories are about customers, their problems, what they need, and the outcomes they want. And the unlock here is the category makes the brand, not the other way around. And yet the entire marketing and entrepreneurship world has it backwards. Well, because they want to fit in and they and they, they can't understand the need to stand out. And also creating a category does require real product innovation and having the courage to innovate in a different way with a product and a solution, which I, I think is hard. I want to talk about one other thing that I think you hate from that before we close out. Comparison marketing, you know, the, the taste challenge, what's better, C Pepsi, Coke, like talk to us about like, should you acknowledge your competitors in your, in your marketing? Or is the whole goal to create a category and be the only, the only competition in that market? Like what, what's your take? Okay, let's do a couple exercises. You ready? Let's do it. You can think about anything you want. Just don't think about pink elephants. No pink elephants, no pink elephants. Under no circumstances, think about pink elephants. You're free <laughs> to think about anything you want. Just no pink elephants, no pink elephants. Think about anything that's uh, better than pink elephants. Think that's taller, shorter, smarter, thinner, gr bigger, blah, 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 blah. But don't think about pink elephants. What's in your mind? Pink elephants. Yes. Now let's look at some facts. At the beginning of the pandemic, there was a competitor to Zoom named Werby. <laughs> I knew. <laughs> We're laughing because uh, I, we know the where, where, where be, whereby people. Yes. Do, do you? Did, 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 well, we, they, I, I did honestly know the, no, we know the ad and we know the, C, the CMO behind the ad, but please give us your full thoughts on it. Please. <laughs> yeah, please. Well. It's, gonna, it's only going to make it better. I promise. So the Werby guys think the best product wins and think that the job of marketing is to explain why we're better. And the truth is, that's what most people think marketing is. That's what most think people think mar uh, entrepreneurship is about. You talk to a founder, you go, look, this is simple. All we fucking need is a demo on our homepage. And if you <laughs> morons in marketing could just do some lead gen or demand gen, by the way, virtually nobody in the demand gen business does anything of the sort. It's all demand capture. We can talk about that if you mm, want. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But the founder says, hey, let's put a demo on the homepage. And you idiots in marketing, you got one job and one job only, which is go buy a bunch of Facebook and Google ads and get people to come to our homepage and show them why we're better. And when that happens, we win. That's the business strategy. That's what everybody gets taught. That's Michael Porter. That's innovator's dilemma. That's all of it. Okay. Where be? So this is what the Werby folks <laughs> do. Okay. So the Werby folks see the category pioneered by my buddy, Eric Yuan at Zoom, who I believe deserves the Presidential Medal of Freedom for doing what he did over the pandemic. And is just an amazing human being. The, fa Love the that fact guy. that Zoom has not blown up all day, every day is unbelievable. The fact that Amazon yeah. has not blown up all day, every day is unbelievable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The fact that AWS scaled <laughs> Through the Worse. pandemic? Are you fucking crazy? Right. I mean, these, these, you know, for all the shitting on technology entrepreneurs we hear in the media, these people deserve the, the Presidential Medal of Freedom for what they've contributed to our country. Okay, where be? So they see Eric design the new category of mobile first digital communication. And as you may recall, he was the, he was the head of engineering at Cisco responsible Webex. for the WebEx product. He joined WebEx as one of their very early employees. Anyway, so they take off. They design the category. They create a radical differentiation with WebEx. The thing starts taking off. The pandemic happens. And we all know they experienced some of the most extraordinary growth in the history of entrepreneurship. So uh, I assume what happens here, Karen, is your brethren at Werby go, here's what we're going to do. We don't have to create anything. They've created more demand in this new category than even they can fulfill. So we're just going to show up and we're going to say, hey, what Eric said, only better. So what does Werby do? They run giant fucking billboards and ads. You know what I'm talking about here, <laughs> yeah, Karen, right? And they say, the New York Times says that Werby uh, is better for our than base. Zoom. That's what the fucking headline says. Well, shit, if the New York Times says Werby's better than Zoom. Now, listen to this. Let's try this. Werby's better than Zoom. 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 
What are you thinking about? How much I like Zoom. <laughs> I'm, not, yes. I'm not changing from Zoom. <laughs> yes. As a matter of fact, it's even worse than that. Not only are they promoting Zoom, but that line, Werby's better than Zoom, the New York Times thinks Werby's better than Zoom or however exactly they expressed it. The ad should have said, Werby declares that Zoom is the category leader and you should buy from them. Mm, Cause they're putting, and they yeah. effectively venmo their entire marketing budget to Eric. That's what comparison marketing does. I would love to try to give an example of where it may work. And, and the reason people do comparison marketing is because it shortens the, you know, path to understand what you do. Oh, you understand what they do. We're just better. And I agree that for the most part, it's executed really poorly. But if you look back at the Cola Wars, and that was actually, you did a really, you guys did a really great article in this. And so I know that you actually uh, had some really good points in there as well. But if you look in the Cola Wars in the 1980s, like a lot of Pepsi's marketing was comparison marketing. And they actually did eat into Coke's market share. Back in the 80s, I think for every six cans sold of Coke, there was a can sold of Pepsi. And over time, they actually nearly got on the par. And they had some incredible ads. I think they had this 1985 ad that had comparison to Coke and it won the Grand Prix and, and uh, whatever the big ad awards is. And I'm sure you don't really care about those. But are there examples where where there's not a lot of differentiation in product? They're, just, they're, so, they're selling brand sugar water. That comparison marketing can work if you execute it really, really well. No. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us what you feel. No, and, and, and to be precise about it, you know, we had an opportunity that I forget her name now, but the gal who was the CEO of PepsiCo for a long time retired and came out with a new book and she tried to get on Follow You're Different and we refused because Pepsi is probably the greatest example of legendarily dumb marketing in the history of marketing. Oh, wow. For that reason. <laughs> and if you look at what the market share numbers are now, they're nowhere close. Yeah, they've reverted. And the customer acquisition cost of, you know, trying to get close and at the time paying Michael Jackson, they did all this stuff, right? And none of it worked. Here's what does work, however. Category to category comparison mm. marketing. Mm, okay, this is interesting. Tell us more. Well, this is how Peloton got successful. So they did not attack spinning. They didn't say, oh, our bike's way better than the spinning bike. Nah. Oh, we have more classes than the spinning class. Nah. They didn't do any of that stuff. <laughs> oh, our, our trainers are better looking. Nah. They didn't do any of that were better than them. They had a category to category comparison. And they did what in category design we call a damn the demand strategy. And what a damn the demand strategy is, you thought you wanted that, but what you really need is this. And here's how it works. Why drive to the gym? Fight for a parking space. Get into a classroom that's stinky with a bunch of other sweaty people in a hot room with some carnival barker screaming at you. Get off the bike soaking wet, feeling shitty and sweaty, and get into your car all sweaty and nasty and drive all the way home. Why do all that when you can work out at home? Right. And so they damned the demand, not at the brand level, at the category level. This is exactly what Netflix did to Blockbuster. And I could give you many, many other examples. And what they're doing there is they're not fighting for existing demand. Oh, here's the culprit. <laughs> oh, no, he's not going to fight. <laughs> the cat is back for another scratch at your face. <laughs> this, this is being, to. being the terror machine. <laughs> he's, I love the cat cameo. He's both a lover and a fighter. And yeah, he, ta <laughs> he tagged me on the nose before our discussion today. <laughs> And so what legendary uh, category designers do is they take demand that is in flow. Imagine like a river is in flow and they do exactly what a dam does, which is it's going in this direction and they go. And rather than having a product to product comparison, which only validates the strength of the leader, they say, hmm, you sure you really want to do that? Have you ever thought about this? And here's the aha. Once people see it, they can't unsee it. And the second part of the aha, and this is a mind fuck for people in marketing, the only company that you and I and anyone else have ever seen evangelizing the category, evangelizing the problem, talking about the power of this new carbon dingulator in terms of what it can do for the world is the category designer. Everyone else competes for demand. Mm -hmm. So, the, the thing that's interesting here, when you market the category with what we call a point of view that is centered on a radically different problem 
and therefore a radically different solution, by evangelizing the problem in the context of what matters to customers, the world assumes you're the leader. You don't have to tell them. And this is why it works. Better is a debate. Different is a choice. And whether it's Peloton or Zoom or another one of my favorites is, is Spanx. Well, she refused to have it called a girdle. It's a girdle. It's a girdle 2.0. In the tech industry, if Sarah Blakely was a tech engineer, entrepreneur, she would say, oh, it's a girdle 2.0. Put a demo on the website for why it's better than existing girdles and Bob's our uncle. Well, guess what? <laughs> she wouldn't be the largest female, self-made female billionaire in the history of the United States had she done that. What Sarah said was, no, 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 no. This is an invention. Look it up. Google Sarah Blakely. Oh, yeah. The first yeah. line of her Wikipedia entry, I'll, I haven't looked at it recently, but it used to say she's an inventor. Inventor. You know why? She told the world she was an inventor, that she'd invented a new category, and she didn't call it a girdle 2.0. Brand Spanx, category, shapewear. And as a result, she was different. And so you can choose between girdles and bras and undergarments of one sort or another or shapewear. And once you believe that shapewear is a good idea, you pick the number one brand. Thanks. And because Spanx and Sarah were evangelizing the awesomeness of shapewear, a new invention, by default, the world assumes that she and Spanx are the leaders in shapewear. Because if you weren't the leader, why would you be evangelizing? Because the only companies that evangelize the category is the category designer who's leading the category. And if we go all the way back to, Karen, one of your discussions around founders and so forth, this is what founders want to do. They want to be a missionary for a new category of a way that we live, work, or play. Right. I love that. I think the, the line of the show today is better is a debate but different as a choice, you know? And I think that is like the core summary of, of what you are, are saying, Christopher, trying to evangelize and help businesses understand. And I, I completely love that. I want to, we got to respect your time. We know you got to jump and everything. It's been an awesome show. I want to thank you for, for joining us. And hopefully we'll talk to you again in the future and, and have some more debate on all of this. Thank you, gentlemen. Keep up the legendary work. And it's been a pleasure being with you. Thanks so much. And we'll see everybody next time on Marketing Against the Green. This data is wrong every freaking time. Have you heard of HubSpot? HubSpot is a CRM platform where everything is fully integrated. Whoa, I can see the client's whole history. Calls, support tickets, emails, and here's a task from three days ago I totally missed. HubSpot, grow better. 